So I'm really excited to be bringing in our next group here with us right now. So we have two joining us. We've got Glenn Thompson joining us. He started his career in conservation in 2015 when he put his boots on the ground as an anti-poaching ranger. In 2019, he became part of the Pangolin Conservation Initiatives in South Africa. From 2022, he was appointed as a legal wildlife trade and pangolin specialist at Transfrontier Africa NPC, a nonprofit conservation organization that runs the Black Mambas APU and the Bush Babies Environmental Education Program. So last year we had Transfrontier Africa join us and we focused on the Black Mambas program as well as the Bush Babies program. And also joining Glenn today will be Sergeant Cute Malongo, uh, a member of the Black Mambas Pangolin Guardians. She has served on an anti, as an anti-poaching ranger since 2014. She's had numerous encounters with lions while doing foot patrols and has represented the Black Mambas on an international stage at events in Belgium and the United Kingdom. She's also part of the Mambas team that was recognized as highly commended ranger team by the IUCN in 2022. So Glenn and Cute are coming in here right now. Sergeant Cute and Glenn, how are we doing today? Doing well, thanks to yourself, Joe. I'm good, thank you. Excellent. Well, it is great to see both of you here joining us live. Um, as I mentioned <laughs> before, uh, a ranger in Africa is not an easy job. So first off, uh, you know, a hats off to both of you and the incredible work that you're doing in the field. No, thank you, Joe. We really appreciate it. All right. Well, I know you have a presentation to share, so I'm going to let the two of you take over for a little bit, and then we'll see how much time we have left for some questions. Okay, no, 100%. Thanks, Joe. All right, the fun part of getting that screen share loaded up and ready to go. Uh, I had a sneak peek at some of the images. Uh, very cool. I see it there backstage. I'm going to bring it front and center. There we go. We're ready. Okay, so Joe, I'm just going to quickly introduce to the viewers and that you don't know what a, a Tmix pangolin is. So the Tmix pangolin, uh, the IUCN status is listed as vulnerable, data deficient, and on the CITES status, it's Appendix 1 animal. Now, the Tmix pangolin is the second largest species of pangolin in Africa. They terrestrial, nocturnal, um, adults weigh anywhere from 8 to 15 uh, kilograms. The males uh, tend to be larger than the females. Their lifespan is uh, 15 years plus. Only African species have adapted to the arid environments that we've got here in Africa. They're not dependent on water sources, but will drink if water is available um, because they actually metabolize their own water from the ants and termites they eat. Um, they love taking uh, mud and dung bars. They bipedal, so they only walk on their two back legs and uh, the scales make up about 20% of their body weight. Now, the distribution of the Tmix pangolin um, is the largest out of the four African species uh, of pangolin. They range from Botswana, Central African Republic, Chad, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Rwanda, South Africa, South Sudan, Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Now, their habitat is normally in areas where they more, have more than 250 millimeters annual rain, um, savanna areas, scrub area, broadleaf, woodlands, grasslands, bush belts, rocky fields and mountainous areas, as well as the sand belt. They predominantly uh, prey on ants and secondly termites. Their foraging activity depends on the season and the weather, so depending whether we're now rainy season or dry season will affect their foraging habits. The male home ranges range from 15 to 50 square kilometers, also dependent on seasons, um, usually a lot bigger than the female's home ranges, which range from 2 to 10 square kilometers, with a polynogamous mating uh, system overlapping with multiple females. The nocturnal normally find refuge in burrows or caves during the day and forage on the ground at night. Um, the reproduction of the pangolin, they normally have one pup a year and the gestation period of 105 days to 140 days, with the pup normally weighing in about three to 400 grams when it's born. Um, the pup normally rides on its mother's back um, once it's old enough to come out of the burrow uh, and when it goes exploring, it usually begins to leave the burrow at about two months old and then weaned um, off its mother between four to eight months. 
and then independence and dispersal from its natal range at around about 10 to 12 months. Population estimates are currently lacking across the range states in Southern Africa and that. Uh, more research on ecology to be conducted and current, uh, current resident research projects that I'm aware of um, are happening in Kenya, Namibia and South Africa. So yeah, just three photos of pangolins out in the field I've worked with and then I'm just going to have two short videos and then I'm going to hand over to Sergeant Q who can talk about her experiences with working in the, uh, with a rehabilitated pangolin in its release. So the first video is just of a pangolin foraging for food. Is it video playing on that side? Okay, we seem to have a problem with the videos. That's okay. Sometimes technology doesn't always cooperate once we get it going. Yeah. Okay, I just want to go back to the... Uh, I think my system's frozen, yeah? Do apologize for that. Oh, no, don't worry, Glenn. If, if you have to shut something down uh, and reopen it, uh, that's no big deal. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to Sergeant uh, Cute now, and then she uh, can explain some of the work she's been involved with with the pangolin. Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge with you about the pangolins. I started working with the pangolins last year. So we were there to rescue it from the butchers. We have informed that there are people outside who are having a pangolin and they wanted to sell it. So we ran there to, to rescue it from them. So we rescue it and take it to the vet where we monitor it and feed it because most of the butchers, if they have the pangolin, they wait so many days to get someone who can buy it. So if it takes them maybe two weeks or three weeks to get a the buyer, they stay with that pangolin, not feeding it. So that is the reason why we take them to the vet. Is the vet will, will help it to see if it's not sick or it has something. So they help help them. So after the re, the release, we took it to the bush. Where we every day we make sure that we are tracking the pangolin with telemetry, locate the pangolin. Some of the pangolin during the day they hide themselves in the cage. Some in the barrels. Because normally the pangolins, most of the pangolins normally eat at the night. Maybe start to eat feed at 10 o'clock at night. So vitally to check up and the weight of the pangolin, to check the, the pangolin behavior, and then check if the tail is not dragging. Because if the pangolin starts to drag its tail, it shows us that it's not okay, or maybe there is something which is not good on it. So check to see if they're walking correctly on its two back legs. Because normally pangolin used its two back legs to walk. So if it uses all the legs and the hands in front, it shows us that it's not okay or something is not okay from it. So in our culture here in South Africa, um, most of the people, they use pangolin as a highly prized animal, often to give them as a gift to the chief. So if the people here in South Africa want to praise this, their chief. They go into the bush and catch the pangolin so that they can give him so, as a gift. So, um, medical use for virus treatment from tra traditional healers, they use pangolin for traditional treatment. And in our belief here in South Africa, we know that if you kill a pangolin, there will be no rain for certain of years. There, is, there, is a, there will be a drought, but for chiefs to kill it, I don't know if they have their own ways how to kill it. So here in South Africa, if you can kill a pangolin, it means there will be no rain for maybe seven years. So, and I'm working with the bush babies where I send message to them about the pangolins because here in the Black Mambas, 
many years of focusing on the animals, forgetting about the pangolins, because it took us so many years to see the pangolins. I myself have been here for nine years. I only saw pangolins last year when we go to rescue it. So I'm teaching people, I'm teaching the young ones about the pangolin so that they can know that even a pangolin, most of the poachers they came here in the bush for it, not only for the rhinos. Thank you. Hi, right, Joe. Okay, uh, that's our presentation. I don't know if you guys have got any questions for Q. Um, I can also, you know, pangolins at the moment um, in Africa are probably one of the highest poached um, animals at the moment, where we're looking at maybe one pangolin being poached every five minutes in Africa. So it's become, you know, more valuable than rhino horn at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what I found when we, we, we connected before for a test call as, call as well, and what I found fascinating was I'd only ever heard of the trade for the scales, um, which is obviously we hear a lot about in the news, but the cultural significance uh, in South Africa and being gi given as gifts and, and, and things like that, that was something I had no idea about. Yeah, no, the, the local usage uh, in Africa, and that's actually sustainable. They actually use very little of a pangolin. I mean, some of your traditional healers in that a pangolin uh, skin and that can last them up to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the local and traditional usage in Africa is sub still sustainable at the moment. I'm not saying that it's always going to be sustainable, um, but the biggest demand for the pangolin scales um, is actually coming from the Asiatics, um, you know, Vietnam, China, that, those areas. Um, so, and then in Western Africa and uh, Eastern Africa, it's also used a lot in the bushmeat trade. And then the scales is a byproduct um, for the legal wildlife trade. So depending where you go in Africa, there are different usages of the pangolins. Um, but in Southern Africa, it's highly praised animals. So that's why you'll find in the Southern Africa regions, um, there isn't much of the bushmeat trade in the, you know, the, those regions because of cultural beliefs. All right, so let's get down to a little bit of, uh, of business and talk a little bit more about what the two of you do. And the first question is, what inspired each of you to become a ranger? Okay, I'll start with you, you can go first. Okay, myself, as a you know that I'm a woman, um, what inspired me to, forget, to become a ranger? Here in South Africa, the only so many people, they believe that no woman can work as a ranger. So this work inspired me a lot because uh, like, it's like a human power. We're showing them that what a man can do, even a woman can do more. So I'm saving these animals for my future generation because I have kids. I don't know what my kids want to become when they grow up. So if I don't protect those wildlife, so there is no more wildlife in the bush. And if my one of my kids wants to become a ranger in future, their dreams won't come true. And we're saving it because here in South Africa, we're only focusing on tourism and agriculture. So if we can protect those wildlife, there will be no people coming from overseas to come here only to see the South Africans. They are interested in those wildlife. So it's the most important thing to us. Okay. For myself, what got me interested to become a ranger is, um, you know, when the rhino poke first started in about 2009. Um, I used to be based up in Joburg and we used to go sit in all the court cases of rhino poaching guys that have been arrested. I sat in court trials and saw how these people got off due to technicalities and everything and that's when I decided I needed to get more actively involved and that's when I started um, with the anti-poaching being boots on the ground, patrolling um, Arctic Five Reserves um, and from there um, the passion has just grown from uh, from boots on the ground, I uh, did necropsies and now actually working with the police in, that, in the recovery of pangolins from the illegal wildlife trade. Um, so over the last couple of years, um, I've experienced everything from, you know, the normal foot patrols, which Sergeant Keats and the Black Mambas do, to actually working with um, police and recovering the actual animals now. All right. And so... The, it's not an easy job. We, we t I kind of mentioned a few of the challenges in uh, the introduction. I think we probably saw a, a few of the challenges in the presentation. But what do, what do each of you find most challenging about the job 
of being a ranger? Much challenging. Okay. We as a black mama is where I'm at. And we are working. We are going out each and every day. And what we are facing people who are, who are armed. Because we are stopping the protest to come into our reserve. So they are armed. So that is the most challenging thing. And we are going into the bush where there is a big fight and armed. And we know that even if we can carry a gun, if the lion wants to kill you, they are going to kill you. So I think it's the most, it's the one which is challenging because we're facing people who are armed and who are unarmed. But there's advantage and disadvantage of armed because most of the people know that black members are unarmed. So they can come to us with a gun because they know that we don't have any gun. So that is our advantage of surviving here in the bush. I think the most challenging when it comes to my side of the work is, you know, you have to be very patient when you're working with these guys who are selling this England on um, the illegal markets. Um, because some of the sting operations where we actually go to rescue these animals, we can actually sit uh, in position for up to four hours, you know, waiting for these guys to arrive with England. And then sometimes they don't arrive. So, you know, I think for us, for me, you know, that's the most challenging is we never know if the deal is actually going to go through. If it is going to go through, we never know if the guys are going to be or not. So, you know, there are just so many variables when it comes to a sting operation and taking these guys down and actually being able to rescue these penguins from the illegal wildlife trade. And then it's been on standby 24-7 because you never know when a deal is going to go down. I mean, I've sometimes received a phone call from the police and said, Glenn, can you be ready in half an hour to come assist us? So I think that's probably the most challenging uh, part of it for me is the uncertainty of knowing exactly what's going to happen and where it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. And then kind of that when something doesn't happen, you know, when you're that, that adrenaline was going while you're waiting uh, and then it doesn't happen, that's probably a frustrating feeling too uh, when the deal doesn't go. Yes, no, it is, especially for all the uh, un units involved. You know, we work with a lot of private security companies in uh, the SAPS. Um, so, you know, we're all excited. To, you know, we want to get these guys, we want to rescue these animals. And um, it, it does happen, you know, the first one or two meetings, the guy doesn't pitch, and then eventually on the third meeting, he'll pitch. But it's just one of those things. And then other operations, they pitch within half an hour of the time they said they'll going to get there. So it just it depends on, I'd say, the mentality of the groups we are working with, how educated they are on, uh, you know, if, if they're just opportunistic, you know, it's normally easier to catch the guys because they want to get, you know, rid of it very quickly. Once you sure. start working with the more sure. organized guys, they're a little bit more warier. Um, you know, they'll have spotters out at the meeting site before they even arrive to make sure that, you know, um, they've got people checking to see if there are any suspicious cars stopping and things like that at areas. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's very challenging. But, you know, at the end of the day, once you've got the penguins, the most rewarding thing. And then, then you know, the hard work starts for the specialized vets and the rehabilitators. To get yeah. The back to a fit state where, you know, we can actually get it back to a release and where uh, Sergeant Kuta and other members are involved, you know, with the follow-up of the penguins, having to go out twice a day, you know, get out in the morning, track the penguin, make sure it's found a burrow that's in your place. Then you come back out later that evening, we have to track it with the telemetry again, find it, then pick it up, weigh it, because um, we have to monitor the weight to make sure it is picking up weight and to make sure it is eating. And then, you know, following that pangolin, you know, for an hour, two hours through the bush, make sure it's foraging properly, it's walking properly on its two back legs. Um, so the post-release monitoring gets very involved and it is quite intensive for the first like month or two. And then from then, the monitoring actually starts slowing down. But, you know, the first month to two months of a post-release is uh, crucial for the uh, successful release back into the wild of the pangolin. Um, and that's where it's very important to have your teams trained up like Sergeant Cute and that on, you know, doing the monitoring, going out, uh, learning the behavior of a pangolin. Um, so that also takes a little bit of time and training and spending many, many hours, you know, following the pangolin out in the bush. Yeah. Because um, when you take them out, we do what we call a soft release process. So we'll go out with them at like five o'clock in the evening and then we follow that pangolin for five hours. So they anywhere from five to eight hours so they can eat enough until they habituate to an area. So that will happen for anywhere from three to five days uh, before we do the full release of a penguin. Yeah, 
Wow. It's, it's, you know, a lot of work goes on after the, the, the sting operation to recover uh, the pangolins. So Sergeant Q, spending all that much time in the bush and following the pangolins and, and monitoring the pangolins, you must have learned a lot about pangolins. Is there something that's, that surprised you about pangolins that you've learned or observed? Yes, I've learned a lot from, from Pangolin, and Len is the one who helped me to learn it, because I never set my eyes on Pangolin before, until that day of, of operation we have done, and get it, and Len told me everything. I thought maybe Pangolin has teeth, but it's where well, I knew that it doesn't, have, it doesn't have teeth, it doesn't bite, and it's only fit on earth. I have gained much, much knowledge from Pangolin, and now I... All in about it, because now I can hold it. I, I was afraid that if I can hold it, maybe it can bite me, but I gained so much knowledge. So it. And all thanks to Glenn, because he helped me a lot about it. Yeah, very cool. And Sergeant Cute, I, I believe I, I heard that you've been out uh, on, on a few of the sting operations. I wonder, how do you feel in that moment? Is it, are you nervous? Are you excited? How are you feeling? when on one of the operations? Okay, <clears throat> I was nervous because I was an arm and I know that most of the poachers do arms because they know that they need money. So they, where there is money, there is a blood on it. So I was nervous, but uh, there were many people there who were, who were armed because they knew that they were facing the dangerous people. So after, after receiving that pangolin, the most, painful thing which I saw there, it was black people who were having that pangolin, because black people who were selling that pangolin. So I thought maybe black people think that these animals belong to the white people, that's why they killed them or what, or not. Because these animals belong to us, it's our heritage, so we must save it. So I think maybe black people thought that these animals belong to white people, that's why they are the one who's responsible for taking care of them. So that is the most painful thing of my life. And there was this lady when we arrested them, there was this lady and a young baby. I think that baby is maybe three months or four months. That is the most painful thing because I'm a mother. I can't get arrested with a little baby. So that gives me much important. I was so happy at working that day. Yeah. And then Glenn, you've, you've been in this career for an extended period of time. When you go on these operations, is it... Is it something that you're used to now, or do you get those butterflies every time when you're going out into the field like that? Look, I don't think you ever get used to it. You know, with every operation, you know, you've got that adrenaline, and you don't actually know, you know, you, we don't know how many people are going to be arriving. And every operation is slightly different. Um, so I don't think you ever get used to it, um, especially when you see the states of, you know, some of the pangolin ones we've rescued them. You know, some of them are in very good health. Well, not good health, but in fair, fair health. And then others you rescue and you actually look at this animal and you actually think, that, are we actually going to be able to save, save this animal from, you know, the trade that they've been in? Um, I mean, I've seen some horrific cases of pangolins, you know, um, that are coming from the legal wildlife trade. And, you know, unfortunately, we do get the cases where, you know, the best way forward is actually to euthanize it. The main, most humane thing is to actually euthanize a pangolin. And that has happened on a couple of cases. And then, you know, once that happens, you know, the whole team afterwards feels a little bit disparate because we weren't able to save this animal. Yes, we've made the arrest, but having to find out later, our two late from the vet that they take to mainly euthanize it, you know, that's kind of, in a way, sort of defeats the object of why we do the sting operations, yeah. even though the sting operations are still very vital. So there is a to the animal with the whole team we work with here in the paper, um, I mean, everyone's very attached to these animals. I mean, like Pete says, once you meet a pangolin, you fall in love with them. They're just so majestic. And, um, I mean, they've been around for 85 million years. Um, they've been around. So, Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's those hard days on the job. But then for every successful release must just, you know, give you hope. And I'm sure you can probably both remember your first successful release it's probably something you hold on to and and that kind of keeps you going yes um i think one of 
probably one of the most success, successful releases. Look, I was only involved with it for the first three or five days, but it's one of the very good colleagues of mine. Is um, It was a pregnant female, and she was released. It was actually at the start of the COVID uh, epidemic in 2019. Uh, luckily, I had emergency permits to travel in the country at that stage for these animals. Um, she gave birth, and then about a year later, she actually conceived a pup in the wild and had given birth to another one. So to me, that is a true successful. Because oh, yeah. Even though she was pregnant when we released her, she actually conceived another pup and had another pup in the wild. So she obviously met up with a wild male. So for me, that is one of the most successful releases we have had. Look, there have been others since then, but that was the first one we've actually ever documented where yeah. the pup has actually survived. And then, you know, a year later, there's another pup. So, you know, it's those small little successful stories that make it all worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. No question. So I want to share just the link here for those who are tuning in and those who will be tuning in later. Transfrontierafrica.org. A lot of great work um, and projects. And, you know, I, I think you two would probably be the first to agree that it takes a whole team and a lot of people working to make these things successful, these projects, the conservation work, the sting operations, the release and re rehabilitation afterwards. It's, it's, it's a huge team that comes together and are obviously very passionate. Yes, yeah, I know for sure. It's a huge team and, you know, a, a lot of partnership working with the specialized vets, working with rehabilitation centers, um, you know, working with the SFPS law enforcement. And then also I do a lot of, I have to work a lot with the National Prosecutors Authority when I need to testify in court against these guys. Um, so there are a whole lot of spanners in the wheel that, you know, come back to just for the conservation of the pangolin. So, you know, it's right down from boots on the ground to the vets, to the specialized rehabilitation centers, to the specialized courts now that we um, have to use for wildlife trading in South Africa. Um, so, yeah, without the uh, collaboration of all the various parties, it would make the conservation a lot harder. Yeah. So cute. One more question for, for you here. This came in via the chat. Do your kids know all about pangolins now? I uh, the only saw pangolins and the photos. <clears throat> like I told you, I've been working here for nine years. I only saw pangolin last year when we go and rescue it. Yeah. They know that I'm working with pangolins. I told them and then uh, I described to them and showed them on the pictures that this is what exactly what I'm doing. Like um, on my leave, uh, last leave, I saw my kids about the there is this story of they call it the prey, which lions kills human beings and something like that. They were surprised that mommy, how do you survive in the bush where there are lions? Because they saw those lions when killing each other. So I told them that I've been there for nine years, I'm surviving. So it means even you, if you want to become one of the rangers, you are going to survive. So they love what I'm doing and they're proud of me. That mommy is, the, is in the bush. And because of this uniform, this military uniform, they, some of them, they do like that. My mommy is a soldier. So that is what they are called. All right. Well, it sounds like they're inspired by your work and rightfully so. Uh, Glenn, cute. Thank you so much for taking some time with us today, for taking us into your world, the important, challenging work that you do. And I imagine that, you know, you're just going to keep doing it because it is so important and, you two definitely have a very important skill set to, to get it done. No, thank you for having us, Joe. We really appreciate it. Thank All you right. for this opportunity to go on with you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. It must be getting into the afternoon for you. And uh, I look forward to reconnecting in the future because I want to hear how the program's going. It's always good to hear stories. Sometimes they're not happy endings but the happy endings i think outweigh uh everything so yes yeah no, for sure. all right well enjoy the rest of your day and we're going to yes. sign off from south africa for now thank you so much